still in the process of working the problem with the backup flight software. That software has been dumped and is being compared by the uh, engineers at uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. We're standing by to uh, hear whether that comparison is satisfactory and whether or not we can pick up the countdown in the next few minutes. Both the commander of John Young and pilot Bob Crippen are involved in this process of comparing of the flight program. This is shuttle launch control. Well, okay. So what they've said is, and what you just heard at home, is what we've just heard here. They fixed the problem, they believe, in fuel cell number three, which was producing too much water. They are still fooling around with the instructions, the memory, the software in one of the backup computers. And Joe Kerwin, who is here with us, bringing his expertise as an astronaut to these proceedings, Joe, you said earlier that if they couldn't fix the, uh, the computer problem, and I think, guess we have to call it that now, mm -hmm. that they won't be able to launch. Is that right? I think that's, that's correct. Uh, I wonder if they fixed it. They said it was just satisfactory. Does that mean that they've gotten it all totally fixed, or do they just uh, convince us that, that they may have been misreading it some kind of I may be one minute behind. They dumped, and they were bringing the computers they're, back. They're still bringing it back. In yeah. op zero. Uh, now, they just said on, sure. on here that we still have the same problem we had initially. Okay. I just heard okay. uh, Crippen or Young say that, yeah. so that... Yeah. We suggest that uh, we don't do uh, any further action until we have a better handle on this. That's the computer yeah, problem. Uh, that uh, depends on the uh, evaluation of the data at Houston and the uh, data retrieval and the uh, review here. The data retrieval here is in process. Are we talking about 15, 20 minutes? Uh, stand by. What OTC Houston. Houston. Go ahead. We're within 38 minutes uh, on the IMU. 38 minutes, Roger, thanks. OTC Houston. Go ahead. Yeah, we don't think, uh, we think we can stretch the IMU constraints. The platforms are looking real good. We have one more suggestion on the BFS before we uh, go all the way to IPL. Uh, that's to take him down to op zero, mode him to halt, mode him to run, then uh, try 101 again. Ops 101 is the basic yes, flight program. Ahead. That's the first okay. stage ascent program. Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't you proceed with that? Copy. Okay, um, CDR PLT yep. on the BFS keyboard. Ops 000. So what we're listening to is some very complicated talk by some very contemporary people. Now, you not only have to be able to fly the thing, you've got to know all that computer lingo because the computers are terribly important. And while they're examining that, no launch on time today, but perhaps launch later this morning, we'll be back after these messages. Saturday, the Blues go undercover to catch a rapist, Hill Street Blues. One more time at the Village Gate, 4755120. One more time. You have to shop a little bit differently at Marshall's. Brand name fashions for you and your family are always arriving. You'll find something new and different every time you shop. So it's to your advantage to shop Marshall's often. Although the same items may not always be available in the same style or color, every item is of the same quality and value. So if you see something you like, buy it. It may not be there when you get back. Look at our prices, compare and see how much you save. Our price tickets tell you whether an item is first quality or irregular. When you find an irregular, it's the exception, because 80% of our merchandise is first quality. You can shop Marshalls with confidence. If you return your purchase within 14 days, bring it to the service desk with a register receipt. We'll gladly give you your money back. And you'll never have to wait for a sale, because you'll always find substantial savings every day, 52 weeks a year. Marshalls, brand names for less. The Hill Street Blues go undercover in drag to catch a rapist Saturday.
morning, everyone. Today, Friday, April the 10th, and let's go now to the launch mission control where we have the shuttle on the launch pad and a hold. The computers on board the orbiter. Uh, one piece of good news was received, though, just recently. One of the major constraints uh, that has to do with the uh, extension of a hold or the time that it takes uh, has to do with the inertial measurement unit, uh, the pre-alignment of that for flight. Uh, that is the constraint which uh, originally said that we had only about 50 minutes left remaining in the hold uh, while we were in this particular hold. The, we have heard from Houston that the platform appears to be so stable that it's possible we could go possibly beyond that without recycling to the T-51 point in the count to begin that pre-flight alignment once again. Uh, in Houston and here at the Kennedy Space Center, they're continuing to work that software problem to determine whether or not we'll be able to go ahead with the launch this morning. This is shuttle launch control. We'll have to check on that. Well, that's the situation. You were just brought up to date on it. If you're just joining us, this is a special edition of the Today program. I have some old friends here in new places. John Chancellor of NBC News, of course, and astronaut Joe Kerwin, veteran of the Skylab mission. We've been here for more than an hour now watching uh, the Columbia out on the launch pad and the situation first developed with the computer that you just heard described there about what was going on. They've got a problem with a backup computer, the software, that is the instructions of the memories, that not listening to two of the primary computers. So they've dumped it out and they're reloading it with a fresh set, not a new set, but a fresh set of the same software and seeing if they can then get it to link up so it will listen as it should what is going on. They did have a little problem with a fuel cell early on as well. That now has been resolved satisfactorily. We are in a hold. The hold was originally 50 minutes, but we were just told that they think that they may be able to expand that. So as they work on the computer problem, the scheduled launch is passed, and we're waiting to see when we may get still another launch. Let's talk for just a moment with Joe Kerwin about the prospects if this does not go off today, or if it doesn't go off by noon today. Yeah, they have approximately a six-hour window. Uh, we've held at a good time because uh, they didn't start the power units yet, and we don't have a refueling problem there. Uh, I would uh, I would expect if they didn't go today, they'd uh, they'd easily be able to get ready to go tomorrow. Would it be tomorrow, or would we have to wait 48 hours, Joe, until Sunday? I there's been a lot of talk about that. I am today. not certain. Yeah. Okay. But I based on where we are in the countdown, I have, I have, I think they could go to. Now, do if, if you look at your screen there, that large tank, uh, the tallest structure, has one and a half million pounds of liquid hydrogen and oxygen in it. What happens to that if they have to wait 48 hours? Once again, I'm not, I'm not certain, and I wish launch control would, 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 tell, us, would <laughs> tell us they may very well have to detank and retank. That's what I think, yeah. and, and that's yeah. of highly volatile stuff. That's the biggest bomb in the world today that's non-nuclear, <laughs> sitting on that pad. And, a, and a, not a terribly thick skin to that as well. That breaks up, it's uh, detached and breaks up. We have standing by outside Bob Dazell in a VIP area, and there he's there with astronaut Jim Lovell who can talk a little bit about what it's like to be sitting up there working on these kinds of problems at this hour. Bob? Hello again, Tom. Uh, Jim Lovell is a veteran of four missions, two Geminis and two Apollos. So I'll ask that question, what's it like when you're sitting out there on the launch pad and they, you, you have this sort of problem? Well, first of all, when you're sitting on the launch pad uh, and everything's going all right, it's very, very quiet. As a matter of fact, there's more excitement watching it from here than it is inside the spacecraft. But as soon as something happens where there's a hold, you're not too sure whether it's going to go or not, then you get a little bit antsy. You want to you wanna go, you, because the biggest thing is, once it lifts off, you know that something's going to happen. It's going to go. But uh, the biggest uh, thrill is waiting for that countdown to get to zero. Was well, there a problem for astronauts that they might want to overlook something to really, let, let's get going, let's get this over with? No, I think they're very, very careful to make sure that everything goes and everything works correctly, especially on this first shuttle launch. What was the worst kind of problem that you ever had? Did you ever have a situation that was similar to this one? Well, my problems occurred after we took off on Apollo 13, if you recall. We had an explosion, and we had to come around and come back home again. So uh, all my problems occurred after I took off. What do you think is going to happen today? Do you have any kind of sense of it? No, I don't. I certainly hope that the uh, computer problem is solved and that, uh, that it will lift off uh, within the launch window today. 
Do you think that there's any way that they can contain the excitement that they feel when they're, when they're sitting up there? It must be really an amazing experience to be waiting to go off into space. Oh, it is, but I think if you recall back at John Glenn, he had about uh, two weeks of delays, and you're sitting down there and going back and forth, so it was quite thrilling uh, at that time, too. Okay, well, thanks for coming by. Tom? Thank you, Robert, and uh, we're back here now. We're looking at, uh, the, well, you're actually looking at all the hardware around the Columbia Space Shuttle, and there's a great deal, of it, a good deal of it was pulled away during the night, and there you can see it. The large bullet-shaped canister, the biggest one of all, that's the gas tank, and then the solid rocket booster is next to that. And then the small, stubby, but elegant little plane, that's the Columbia Orbiter. And loaded in there now, astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen, and they're working on a problem with the computers. And as a result of that problem, we're about oh, 17 minutes past the scheduled launch time in a hold. The problem is in a computer. And they're dumping out the software and reloading some fresh instructions. And we'll be back with more from Cape Kennedy, from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral first after this. Nobody but nobody gives you a better deal than the Dime Savings Bank of New York when you buy or renew your savings certificate. High interest rates, a cash bonus, or the Dime's widest gift selection ever, and a safe investment. A fabulous selection of gifts available at any Dime branch when you buy or renew a $10,000 26-week certificate. All that and more. Selected branches are open seven days a week to buy or renew a certificate, and your investments are insured because we're a member of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. With all the bad news for consumers, these days, Aaron's, the 50-year-old Brooklyn store with incredible fashion values for women, announces some good news. We've doubled our selling space and added racks and racks of designer sportswear dresses, suits, coats, furs, and handbags, all at prices 25 to 50 percent lower than suggested retail. And unlike some discount stores, Aaron's gives you a refund or exchange. Aaron's, the store that has always given you more for less, now gives you more and more for less. Aaron's at 5th Avenue and 17th Street, Brooklyn. Free parking. Do you know my name? I've passed 120 pieces of major legislation, including the law allowing seniors to buy any prescription for $2. Also, I'm the original sponsor of the Pinelands Protection Act, and I just introduced a bill to restrict the sale of deadly handguns. I'm the president of the New Jersey State Senate and often serve as acting governor. And with your help, we can do more. For Governor Merlino, Democrat. Don't leave New Jersey without him as governor. Me, David Copperfield. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do with a Copperfield? What can we do? Someday I'll get out of here. Someday I'll be free. Someday I will write a book. We'll see. You'll see. Copperfield, a new musical classic. Tickets at the Anta Theatre or call charges. It is possible that uh, we will have to recycle to the T-minus 20-minute point uh, in the near future, depending on what determination is made in the next few minutes uh, in order to uh, reconfigure the Kennedy Space Center uh, and get into the situation the proper that's going on now. go forward again. One of the determining factors in uh, the ability of us to hold is the inertial measurement units. Uh, we are coming to the point uh, approximately 20 minutes from now when uh, we would have to go back and realign them and uh, that uh, requires going back uh, at least for that to the T minus 51 minute part. Uh, however, the, uh, most of the systems would be held at the T minus 20 minute point and that is what the hold clock would say. At present time, we are dumping the general purpose computers uh, and having them analyzed uh, at Houston. This is shuttle launch control. Okay, that's the voice of Hugh Harris, and he's been describing what is going on here. We've, uh, we're now uh, 20 minutes past the scheduled launch time because they have a problem with the computers on board, specifically with the backup computer not matching up with the four primary computers. This is a computer-driven uh, space age that we live in, as we well know, and this is very important. They don't want to send it up there without that backup computer working. Uh, what they're doing is getting a reading from the managers here at Kennedy as to whether or not they can 
do without 75 seconds worth of data so they can tie up the lines and send it all down to Houston and take a look at it there where they have the experts. Is that a fair summation, Joe Kerwin? Or That's what's going on. Yeah. But yeah. there's one other thing, Tom, which you also heard, and that is that they're running out of time a little bit in terms of some navigational aids. Uh, and in specifically the inertial measurement unit, they, if they've only got about 18 more minutes of, of, of that particular gadget being aligned uh, so that it can help uh, in the navigation, stop me if I'm wrong, Joe. And well, if, if John, they, I heard Neil Hutchinson in Houston say that the inertial measurement units were looking so <laughs> good that he could probably give them an extension on that time. But if they do, if they are going to get an extension, then they'll know at half past the hour now. Yes, sir. Uh, if they can't get that extension, they'll have to go back to 50 minutes before launch in terms of the or countdown. Or 51, I or guess. 51, yeah. and, and to, uh, to realign the inertial measurement unit. So you get complexities within complexities on these Indeed. things. All right, let us talk just for a moment and bring you up to date why it's important that they get a launch today before noon. One of the reasons it's important, they don't want to land in California after dark. I mean, we're, we're dealing with uh, the time zones in this country. They're due, to, uh, they're due to land in California about midday out there, and if they get too delayed here past noon Eastern time, then they would have an after dark landing in California, and they don't want it because they're coming in just like this, a dead stick landing, and we'll be talking more about the landing procedure. It's, it's quiet out there now. Okay, we have uh, Bill Lynch standing by at the White House, John, and uh, uh, President Reagan has uh, sent a message to these astronauts today. Bill? Well, Tom, the President uh, got up about 15 minutes before the initial scheduled launch time, and like millions of other Americans, he's watching this coverage on television and probably has his fingers crossed that the Columbia does get off on time. Last night, he sent a good luck message to astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen, wishing them a safe and successful mission. Through you, he said, we all feel as giants once again. Once again, we feel the surge of pride that comes from knowing we are the first and we are the best and we are so because we are free. He told the astronauts that as they hurtle from Earth in a craft unlike any other ever constructed, they will do so in a feat of American technology and American will. Yesterday, Vice President Bush telephoned uh, astronauts Young and Crippen, wishing them a bon voyage. And tomorrow, if all goes well, he will speak to them in orbit the astronauts will be in orbit, not the vice president, uh, on a radio hookup from here at the White House. And on Sunday, he plans to be in Houston to meet them when they return to the Kennedy uh, Space Center there. The president, meanwhile, continues to make a good recovery, and his doctors this morning are laying good odds that he'll be released from the hospital tomorrow. Tom? Thanks, Bill. Kennedy Space Center here, Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. This is a special edition of the Today program, and my friends are in New York this morning. Let me say good morning now to Jane Pauley and to Cliff Morrison for sitting in for Lord Scott to keep us abreast of the weather. Good morning, folks. Morning, good morning, Tom. And we're watching television, of course, like yeah. everyone else, but we're, as we anticipate uh, stepping off a bit into the future, uh, we're the ones, or at least to have a good foot in the past. You got to have faith that that thing's going to get off and safely and back again. Well. A lot of people have had faith in the Chicago Cubs all these years. One of them, Bryant Gumbel, is at Wrigley Field, and we think that's important because Wrigley is that stadium where they don't even play baseball at night. Talk about a foot in the past, huh, Tom? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we've got a lot of winners. The Cubs are winners as well. We're going to uh, continue with our coverage of the space shuttle, the launching of the Columbia, now in a hold situation as they try to fix one of the computers. We'll be back, but first, this is Today on NBC. Q1, we built the world's first microcomputer system. There's a Q1 system in every major U.S. space center. Our microcomputer innovations are saving time, money, and space for large and small companies in over 20 countries around the world. We'll do it for you, too. We're Q1, a leader in microcomputer technology. Q1, changing the way the world does business. Looking for a new car? Look at these unbelievable Potemkin Cadillac prices. 1981 Coupe de Ville. 1981 Sedan de Ville. 1981 Fleetwood Brougham. 1981 El Dorado. You can't get a better deal. Order yours today. If this nameplate isn't on the back of your car, you probably paid more than you should have. Honey. 
Please, for God, you didn't. I didn't. You didn't. It's Maxim. Sarah, fresh perked coffee. You didn't. She did it! It's Maxim. <laughs> Maxim freeze-dried coffee has a rich ground aroma and rich taste. So close to fresh perked, they'll think you did when you didn't. Oh, Lenny, you did it. I didn't. It's Maxim. <laughs> it tastes fresh perked when it's Maxim. Spring arrives with Stanley Blacker, a vibrant full of fashion with a flow. Seasons change with Stanley Blacker, April showers leading to May's glow. You'll blossom in your Blacker, a texture with a soft design. Available at Bloomingdale's. We're back, and let's listen now to Hugh Harris from the Kennedy Space Center at launch this control. particular point in the countdown. This is shuttle launch control. What he just said was that they are continuing to watch the computer problem, uh, and that's, that analysis is still going on. They are now expressing what uh, Hugh Harris uh, at launch control calls called some concern about the inertial measurement unit, which is part of the navigational system here. They may have to realign that, but no decision has been made. If they do have to realign it, it pushes the countdown back even further. The hold has gone on now for 35 minutes because of these various problems. Most of them are solved, although the people who have been watching the fuel cells, remember it was fuel cell number three that gave them some difficulties, feel that there may be too much pressure on those fuel cells and they've switched back at least to partial power from the ground. We trust you understand all that. Uh, I think I do, but I'm not absolutely certain. That's what they just told us, though, from launch control. What about that, Joe Corwin? What does that mean, that, they, that they've just hooked it back up to a ground system is, instead of having They're it? They're simply now sharing ground power. They, uh, they, they turn the ground power back on at a slightly higher voltage, and it takes over some of the load. Does that mean that there's still a problem in fuel cell number three, do you think? No, not at all. I think this is purely a precaution. As long as we're in the hold, uh, you might as well let the ground do some of the work well as well. Might as well relieve the fuel cells of some of the burden. Yeah, that's not a problem. But the computer still may be, and one of the things that I find interesting about this is that you have to ask Houston. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to go to Houston right now where we have Roy Neal standing by, and he has some uh, information for us on this computer situation. Roy? Well, not so much that. We're like you, uh, Tom, listening very carefully here to Neil Hutchinson and all of his flight controllers as they work this problem over. I notice Hugh Harris there at the Cape talking about dumping data. Well, that means they're feeding data through to the people here. And all of the back rooms, the support rooms, are extremely busy right now studying, looking this thing over, uh, particularly their concern at the moment being the inertial measurement unit. That's one of the black boxes on board filled with gyros. And when you get it back there at the Cape, you might ask Joe Kerwin how you, how you realign those gyros, because they're in a black box down inside the spacecraft, and the astronauts are up on the flight deck of which I have a simulator here, but uh, the flight deck does the controlling, and uh, it'll be interesting to find out. Well, right now, the biggest question seems to be, however, still that backup computer, and whether or not it's accepting commands at this writing, we don't know. So we're listening very carefully for launch control at the Cape and for Houston's mission control to tell us exactly what it is there. And by the way, something else I'd like to mention. At this writing, there is no danger to those astronauts on the pad. Everything's going fine, except for minor glitches. But uh, there is another escape system. It's called slide-by-wire. And Tom, that's another question for Joe Kerwin, if you'd like to ask him. I'd like him to describe the slide-by-wire if they had to use it. OK, we'll do that, Roy. We're going to have a couple of questions for him. Uh, first of all, about that backup computer. That's purely a precautionary measure, one of many, of course, on this flight. You were just saying a moment ago, the irony is they may never use it. That's right. We should go through a nominal flight on the prime computers uh, and uh, never ask the backup to take over control. But it's still a very important backup because all four of the prime computers have the same identical set of instructions in them. We're not worried about a hardware problem. What we're worried about is a fault in the instructions an erroneous set of instructions, which would then be common to all four of the prime computers and wipe them all out at, at, at one time. That's what the backup's for. It has a totally different set of software in it. Right. So Roy was just talking about if they had to evacuate in a hurry while they were still on the pad. 
they do have a kind of uh, fancy getaway system up there, uh, fancy but at the same time primal. Yes, yes, which we've never had to use for real, fortunately. Of course, they'd have to get the white room back out, yeah. get the hatch open, get the crew uh, uh, across the tunnel onto the launch uh, structure or across to the other side of that, and then they have a little, uh, uh, a little wheeled cart that uh, hangs on, uh, on a couple of wires. You get in and pull the handle, and off you go and slide down. It must be a mile from the pad. And then if, uh, if things are really in tough shape, that they can get into a kind of armored personnel carrier and drive their way out of there. That's right, yeah. But they probably just want to hunker down there. That's in the worst possible case scenario, which we don't expect. We have no such morning. problems as that. Yeah. No, I think that ought to be emphasized yeah, no, this we're morning, that uh, no, we're not having any safety problems. What uh, the uh, mission is experiencing is a, is a computer problem, essentially. Uh, that the computers don't all tally, but with a machine that complicated, you can't fly it without computers. You just can't get it around. They have, as Joe Kerwin was saying earlier, they have, I believe it's six computers all told aboard. They have the four operational. They have one that is a computer designed to settle disputes with the other computers, and then they have one they haven't plugged in, I understand, that they can also use. There's a spare in the mid-deck, and should during the mission one of the computers fail, they can go and plug this other one in, load it with instructions, and put it into the uh, common set. Well, the computers will be doing a lot of work during the course of this mission. We ought to talk about those moments in which the astronauts will be kind of hands-on pilots as well. I mean, as shortly after takeoff, John Young is going to take the controls when they separate from the external tank and move it away out of plane at one point, right? That's that's correct. Uh, uh, the powered flight portion of launch is is automatic. John has a takeover capability, but we hope we won't have to. We have a message yep. coming up in about 15 seconds, fellas. This is from uh, Hugh Harris. He is speaking for the mission for the launch control from the Kennedy Space Center here at Cape Canaveral in Florida. So we are in a hold situation. They are working on the computers. And now this let's is shuttle launch control at T-minus nine minutes and holding. Uh, we have been holding now for approximately 45 minutes and have approximately 16 minutes remaining in the time before we would have to realign the IMUs. We have been told by Houston that they're extremely stable and we may be able to extend the hold slightly beyond what is normally contemplated. At the present time, we have not had a reading as to uh, how we are. Uh, we are listening now to Houston, uh, where they are talking about what may be a uh, the possible problem that caused the uh, backup software uh, to look as though it might not be satisfactory. Uh, but at the present time, we do not have a determination as to uh, how long we may hold at this particular point. Uh, there has to be a decision in the near future as to whether to go back to a different point in the countdown. But at the present time, we're at T-minus nine minutes in holding. This is shuttle launch control. So if they, if they decide that they have to go back to the, I'm looking at a clock here, if they decide at half past the hour that they have to go back to an earlier point in the counter, the, count, the point at which they align the inertial measurement unit, they'll have to go back 50 minutes right. into it. Yep. And we're at a hold situation right now. They're trying to fix the computers. We'll have continuing coverage here from the Kennedy Space Center on this special edition of today. The time now for a station break. Sunday on Chips, Punch races to save a go-kart menace headed for disaster. Dancing. Problems too, so uh, I still hope we go today because the weather's good, and that's doubtful this time of year here in Florida, of course. So uh, this has been an excellent day on the weather. Senator, is it worth all this? You've got 14 billion dollars in this this program. Talking about this space shuttle program. Uh, everybody here this morning uh, certainly pulling for it to get off and to get out there, and for the astronauts to get back safely. But is it worth it? Well, I think it is, and you know, it, research is the easiest thing to cut because you're, it's not like you're buying six trucks from General Motors or Ford. Uh, you're doing research. You don't know the objective of what you're out there for. It's like the first caveman. He looks over the hill, and he, he, they warned him, don't go over. It's dangerous over there. But he finds things. He finds a leaf that he rubs on a sore on his leg, and it becomes better. 
And as the boil becomes better or something, he finds better things to eat, his kids grow taller. It's, it's the nature of research, and it's what we're laying down in this country, and other nations are picking up and, and going ahead of us. And it's, uh, that's why we're behind in automobiles. Why are we behind in steel? Why are other nations picking up this lead from us? And space is, uh, is sort of the farthest out type, most basic research uh, that we have. And uh, so uh, you're looking for new facts and new patterns, and along the way you find a lot of things come out of it in the way of new materials and new optics and uh, new ways of making crystals for uh, electronics and for computers and, and all of these things that do make it very, very much worthwhile. I think someone in, uh, has run some studies showing that of the money spent so far on NASA, it has come back in new products and benefits to our economy of somewhere around eight to one for every dollar spent. Now, even if that's off by a considerable factor, that's still a, a good advantage. Now, that is the basic argument for the space shuttle program and for the space program in general. When you're back home in Ohio and people make an argument against the program or say, well, look, Senator, I don't want to be cynical about it, but I am a little skeptical about it, what do you consider to be the most valid arguments against spending this kind of money on this kind of program? Well, people have concerns because we're cutting back right now, of course, in uh, budget cut times. We're cutting back on social programs that are a benefit to people. And uh, it's very tough to say that we should continue with research at the same time that we are, are cutting social programs where people have problems with uh, uh, the propulsion and the tanking and that sort of thing. Can Good morning. Welcome back to the special edition of today. You're listening to Hugh Harris from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape uh, Canaveral, Florida, as they discuss the problems with the computer. We have not had a resolution yet of what the problem is with the backup uh, flight computer programs and are waiting for that resolution uh, before going further. But right now, we are changing the clock back to the T-minus 20-minute point in the countdown. And this means that we will go ahead and also do an inertial measurement unit realignment, which occurred at the T-minus 51-minute point normally. This is shuttle launch control. So that's an update on the situation there. They are continuing to work on a backup computer problem, and as a result of not getting it solved during the last hold that they had within time, they had to back it all up to T minus 20. That means that the hold will continue, but it will give them a better chance to work on the problem and also then to realign the uh, inertial measurement units. And right. it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that the launch will go 20 minutes from now, either. No, no, it doesn't. It means that we're in a hold at that point. They've got all kinds of markers that they hit. Some of them are holes, and some of them mean that the clock is moving. It means the systems are all in a known configuration so that they can start them down and 20 minutes later get to lift off. Because there are lots of little checkoffs that they have to go through, and they have oh, to yeah. back it up in this case oh, because yeah. they needed the time to realign. And what uh, Joe was just telling us, this is Joe Kerwin, one of the astronauts, if you're just joining us, was just telling us that what happens is that the, we're talking about a black box in effect out there, the IMU, mm -hmm. the inertial measurement unit, and there are gyros in that. Right. That get a little bit out of sync, if you will, mm -hmm. just by their presence out there. Mm -hmm. A little friction works on them and so on. Just so. And the navigation is that critical in this kind of a flight that you can't have them. It's very important at launch that the gyros be aligned very, very well. Uh, Can we come back to off at one? Uh, we'll okay. set them back to on again. You know, it sounds all through this as though this okay, vehicle is so question. tender and sensitive that we have to have perfect computers and perfect weather and perfect winds and all that. This is a first flight kind of a thing. And everything should be perfect. Uh, but in a year or two, I think you'll find us flying with uh, lower ceilings and visibilities. We'll eventually have an automatic landing capability, a night landing capability. Uh, and uh, it's got a lot of performance envelope, potentially. We, uh, what we're going to do right now is that we are going to go to Washington, D.C. at the Janey School in Washington, D.C. Uh, from here, they've been shifting the problem between Kennedy Space Center and the Mission Control in Houston. We're going to see what the kids at the Janey School in Washington, D.C. have to say. And Eric Burns is standing by there where they are watching all of this this morning. Eric? Tom, like us, not only watching but waiting. Uh, we understand in one sense that we got here a day late because yesterday there was a very spirited debate uh, about the economics of the entire space shuttle. And what we want to do now is see if we can reconstruct a little bit of that. Let me introduce the two principles in yesterday's, uh, well, the way I was told, heated debate. First of all, on my left, you are? Michael Spector. And on my right? Joe McCarthy. Michael, let's start with you. Pro space shuttle, right? Yes. 
Uh, what are the reasons that we should go ahead, assuming that the uh, technical problems this morning are resolved? Well, it would be um, very helpful uh, scientific-wise, and um, space travel, you know, it would help us in the future. Um, many products have come from space travel, and um, the reason um, John's against it, um, to social programs, say space Pro, um, program, the problems only have to be solved once, but with the social programs, they have to be solved many times. All right, it sounds like you've got every angle covered, and from why, what I understand, you don't buy any of that. Is that right? No, I, I don't. Why should we? Why should we not be spending all this money on the space shuttle, Stephen? Because I think my name is John. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> and don't ever correct me again on the air, John. <laughs> I'm well, teasing. Go ahead. I think it's a waste of money to spend it on the space shuttle at this time. I think we should spend it on more social programs like Head Start and things because many people um, are affected by this and nine billion dollars is a lot of money to be spending on um, a space shuttle and it could help a lot of um, people in social programs. I wonder if we could just do this with kind of a voice vote here because the mic isn't going to reach all around but uh, you do have something you want to say. Yeah, Go ahead. The space shuttle is very good for uh, society because they're saying because running out of oil um, right now, and the space shuttle, Jupiter is full of hydrogen, and pretty soon now they're going to be, um, be able to use hydrogen as fuel. So what they can do, some, what did you say, in your future, is go to hi Jupiter and get the hydrogen from Jupiter and sell it cheaply for uh, fuel. All right, I, I have to stop you for just a second, somewhat amazed by the the fact that these are sixth graders talking and certainly things I didn't know when I was in sixth grade. We'll be back later, we hope, when, uh, when there is a liftoff. Right now, uh, back to the Cape, and here's John Chancellor. John. When you were in sixth grade, what about when I was in sixth grade? <laughs> I knew nothing about this stuff. We did, however, have Buck Rogers, and all of that seems to be coming true. We're in a holding situation here at Cape Canaveral. The astronauts are safely in their flight, on their flight deck. This problem with the computer remains. They're talking about it in Houston, here at the uh, Space Center, the Kennedy Space Center, and it's unresolved so far. Uh, we are in a longer hold, and for those of you who are keeping a tally of the countdown, we are at 20 minutes in holding, but that does not by any means mean that uh, the sh spaceship Columbia will lift off here in 20 minutes. It looks like it's going to take longer than that. Some famous people here, and one of them very famous in the space program, a name we all learned some years ago, Wally Schirra, and he's with Robert Bazell now in the VIP section. Hello again, John. Mr. Schirra is a veteran of Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo, the only astronaut to be in all three programs. Good morning, Mr. Schirra. How are you today? Fine, thank you. The hardware that we're talking about having a problem here today, is this shuttle a lot more complicated than the, ones you, uh, than the vehicles you flew in? Oh, it's a whole new world. Uh, I think what most people don't understand about shuttle is that it's meant to fly with a lot of good equipment on board where we depended upon so many controllers on the ground to monitor the flight. Ultimately, if shuttle does its task, and I don't mean just today, I mean sometime in the future, you'll see it controlled by the crew on board with a lot of equipment. So they want that equipment to work now so they can relieve that workload we used to have on the ground. Well, doesn't all that hardware give you the kind of problems that we're seeing now? Is, is this sort of thing to be expected, the first first launch of a new vehicle? I was surprised that they had problems with the fuel cell. We used that uh, right in, back in my Gemini days. In fact, I, I was the last battery-powered Gemini. Gemini 7 that we rendezvoused with back in 65 had fuel cells. The fuel cell has always been an awkward device. It has a membrane that no one's really made the right one for. I had great hopes for a fuel cell being a power plant. There's one in downtown New York, and it still isn't producing the power we expected it would. But what about these computers? Can, do you think we're going to see a lot of these kind of breakdowns in the launches, at least the first few in the shuttle series? I'm surprised about the computer. Now, what they're really talking about is not the computer, if you recall, it's the software load. So it really means the language that the computer has hasn't been talking properly. In fact, I'm in that business myself, and it's very difficult to make a computer understand what we want. A computer's dumb. <laughs> it has no logic at all. It is, it's all put in by man. It all comes out by man. So someone apparently had a, a glitch, I hate the old expression, in the computer software. I asked this to Jim Lovell before, with whom you rendezvoused in, in Gemini, but what's it feel like when you're sitting up there and things start, start to go a little bit wrong like this? Well, you don't like it because you've had these years of anticipation, so many years of training, but again, if you talk about the two coolest guys in the state of Florida, it's probably 
John Young and Bob Crippen up there because they're they are fully aware of what's going on. They're on the communications loop. They're hearing much more than we're hearing. They're involved with the troubleshooting. And of course, they're anxious to go. But they, they know that this is not a case we have to rendezvous with a lunar mission. We have to be at the right time. The window's big. And they're in a much more comfortable seat than I was in my Mercury flight, I'll clue you. <laughs> they probably are, but I don't know how comfortable they, they really are. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Shira. And now back to you, Tom. Thank you, Bob Bazell and Wallace Shira. One thing about astronauts, they don't seem to age. He looks as young as he did when he was going off into space himself. Let's go to New York now. Jane Pauley is standing by there with news of what else is going on in the world. Not much going on here right now where we sit, but of course there's a lot of frantic activity, uh, Jane, at the Kennedy Space Center and at Houston as they try to fix that computer. What else is happening this morning? Oh, thank you, Tom. In Atlanta, autopsy results are expected today in the death of Larry Rogers. He was the 23rd young black killed in Atlanta in the last 20 months. Roger's body was found in an abandoned apartment building, and police are hopeful that the killer left fingerprints, which they could trace. Only one other body was found indoors. At 21, Rogers was older than most of the other victims, but he was severely retarded and had both the mind and the body of a child. In money matters, gold sank further below the $500 mark today. The opening price in London was $491, down $7 from the previous close. Mexico and Ecuador have cut the price of crude oil by about $2 a barrel, and Kuwait's oil minister says the worldwide surplus will probably force OPEC to hold the line on oil prices for the rest of 1981. The South's only commodity exchange has just been opened in New Orleans. We have a report from Sean Daly of WDFU-TV in New Orleans. With the ringing of the bell, we are proud to announce that trading will begin at the New Orleans Commodity Exchange in Mill Rice. Let the ceremony begin. And with that, they did. For the first time in New Orleans since the 1960s, the madness of a commodities exchange. This is now the only active commodities exchange in the South, replacing the New Orleans Cotton Exchange, which ended 93 years of activity in the mid-60s. Commodities are back because the port of New Orleans has grown since then. It's now number two in the country and because commodities are now big business here. For instance, 65% of the country's soybeans are shipped through New Orleans. It is that kind of port activity exchange experts are hoping to capitalize on, hoping that southern farmers and consumers will want to buy and sell their commodities in their own region. Exchange experts are also banking on a strong need for trading in rice, a commodity no other exchange trades. Sean Daly for NBC News, New Orleans. Now let's go right back to Tom at the Cape. Thank you, Jane. You're listening once again. We have a number Hugh of Harris constraints. from the Kennedy Space Center. The propellants which are on board uh, are not a constraint. We can hold at the flight mass uh, as long as necessary. The, uh, one of the main constraints is that we have to go back and do a pre-flight alignment of the inertial measurement unit. Uh, this occurs at the T minus 51 point in the countdown, and uh, this can be done without recycling all of the other elements back that far. The other elements of the launch vehicle and the ground support can stay at the T minus 20 minute point. Uh, one of the main constraints as far as picking a launch uh, time is the crew uh, rules. The uh, Doctors have determined that the crew should not remain in a horizontal position uh, in their seats on the pad uh, for longer than six hours and do not want to have them awake between the time that they're awakened and the time they have their first sleep period in space longer than 20 hours. At the present time, this is not a, a serious threat to uh, recycling the countdown. However, it is one thing which has to be considered. At the present time, we are standing by for an estimate of when we can uh, target the, uh, the countdown for. We have not had a resolution from uh, Houston uh, or from here at the Kennedy Space Center of whether or not the backup uh, flight software is a proper configuration or not. Uh, it has been determined that one uh, portion of that uh, computer program has never been run before uh, in, uh, in the simulations which have been conducted. And that is presently being looked at very hard. Uh, it is being put through the facilities in Houston 
uh, which determine whether or not the computer programs are valid or not. So we're standing by here uh, for a determination of a target liftoff time and also for a resolution of what needs to be done on the flight, uh, the backup flight programs. We're at T minus 20 minutes and holding. This is shuttle launch control. All right, that's a pretty thorough briefing on where we stand. They don't have a launch time scheduled yet for the launching of the Columbia because they're continuing to work on the backup computer problem, which wasn't listening properly to the four primary uh, computers. This uh, space shuttle has been plagued by problems in the past. It's about two years overdue, overdue this morning here, and it's now uh, just about one hour past its scheduled launch time, and they are not able to come up with a new one yet. We are at T minus 20 at this time and holding. They started the clock once again, and then they held it, as you could see, right at 20 minutes. It strikes me, Joe Kerwin, a little bit curious that one portion of that backup software had never been run before. Were you aware of that? No, I wasn't, not at all. And it strikes me as a little curious, too. It must have been a last-minute patch to the software, as, as they call it, and it must have looked on paper like such an innocent little patch that it wouldn't interact with any of the important software. And it may not be the problem. Well, as so often well, happens, perceived see. innocence can be a real evil. And that's in this right. case, they're continuing to work on the problem. We still don't have a launch time, but we will continue our coverage from the Kennedy Space Center and the launching of Columbia, the space shuttle. But first, this word. The day cannot begin soon enough for a man possessed by a single aim in life. He is compelled by his drive to win. A stockbroker with this winning attitude wants to know everything that's happening, and he wants to know it first. Morning, Bill. How do we open in London today? He's a Bates broker. The winning attitude at Bates. Put it to work for you. IBM has a big surprise for you, our executive copier. It has excellent copy quality. It's extremely reliable and comes with IBM service. It's easy to use. And it's very, very, very small. The IBM Executive Copier. Seems folks are doing nothing but going back to basics. Living in blue jeans, 100% cotton denims, of course. Like these Sedgefield do-nothing jeans. They're specially treated, so you do nothing to them, and they still look and feel terrific. They wash up with no wrinkles, no puckers, no ironing. Some fit for doing nothing. When you're looking for blue jeans, check the label. Be sure you're looking at 100% cotton denim. Cotton performs. There she sits, out on the launch pad. You can, uh, if you were to be close enough, you could see the Orbiter Columbia with its two solid fuel rocket boosters and its large external tank. That's the large bullet-shaped canister that you see, the largest of the white uh, pieces of mechanism that you see before you. They are not able to give us a time yet on when they may be able to launch the space shuttle after more than two years of delay. Some last-minute problems developed here this morning in first uh, a computer and then a fuel cell and then once again the computer problem was not resolved and that's what they're at work on now sending information and uh, discussion back and forth between kennedy uh, the space center here at cape canaveral between the columbia orbiter and the johnson space center in houston texas uh, they were also talking about the possibility of having something to do with the configuration of the astronauts. They're in a horizontal situation. They're back like this a lot. Yes, I, I would take issue with Wally that uh, his Mercury seat was, was less comfortable. That was an individually molded couch, as you recall. These guys are in a standard airline type seat without much padding, and uh, they're uh, lying horizontal. You're a doctor. Up. You're a yeah. doctor. Why would the doctors be worried about him being in that kind of a shape for about six hours? I mean, we spend uh, six hours sleeping. Oh, it's six hours of inactivity more than anything else. Well, uh, aren't their feet in the air in the sense that their feet are up and the, uh, and in the, the blood uh, would run toward the head? In it's that a little bit like being upside down or being in negative G. And that, that negative G, that is the acceleration pushing the blood toward your head, is going to be more intense during launch. 
They get about 1G negative out of 3G total uh, during lunch. That's not harmful. We've simulated it. Uh, but you don't want to preload them too much, okay? However, that's a soft limit, six hours. I think you have to uh, pry John and Crip out of there with a shoehorn yeah, if there's and, a chance to go. And Dr. Kerwin as well, they were talking about the, the doctors didn't want them to go 20 hours without that's sleep. That's right. 20-hour day is a, is a prudent limit so that a fatigued crew member won't make mistakes, okay? But what they can do in this case is to eliminate some of the activities at the end of the first day, let the crew go to sleep, uh, more or less on time and pick those up in the morning. So they've got flexibility there too. So we're in pretty good shape. The big problem remains the computer and getting that solved. That's and right. We just don't know when that's going to get done. John and Crip are programmed. Their software is go. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to me, Tom, that we got down to nine minutes before this thing was going to go off. The engines were turning on the chase planes. Yeah. Everybody was ready, and it looked it wasn't as though it wasn't going to have any problems. I wonder what at all. the chase pilots are doing. They're probably back getting a load of fuel. And uh, uh, at this point in the countdown, I think they've turned their engines off. I think it calls for that uh, at that point. Well, yeah. they're probably like us. They're listening for further word here from, uh, from the Kennedy Space Center. It's, the problem has been going on for quite a long while now, and, and uh, coming up just now, Tom, uh, we are one hour behind launch, right as of this minute. All right, seems like a good time to take a station break. Fugitive from the Empire, a world premiere movie. Death Trap. Death Trap. Broadway's smash comedy thriller is an evening of laughs and screams and fun and games and murder. Ira Levin's Death Trap is sheer terror and pure delight. Death Trap, starring Farley Granger on Broadway at the Music Box Theater. <laughs> Murderously funny. America's first space shuttle. Frank Field reports on News 4 New York. We're back. Let's listen now to Hugh Harris, who is speaking to us from the Kennedy Space Center. And the uh, portion of the mission, and the fifth one is designated the backup. The backup computer has not been communicating properly with the other four computers during the checkout and an examination is being made of the a backup computer program to determine whether or not the trouble lies in that particular program. At the present time, we are standing by for a determination of a target launch date, or a target launch time, actually, uh, today, and uh, then we'll begin with the inertial measurement unit pre-alignment and go down through the countdown so that if the problem is resolved, we will be able to have the launch this morning. This is shuttle launch control. Well, Tom, that last uh, didn't sound so optimistic. If yeah. the problem is resolved, we'll have a launch this morning. That's the first time I think that uh, Hugh Harris has used that particular formulation. One of We're just listening to chatter now between yeah. communication. Between well, I, one of the things that strikes me is that when they first began to work on the computer problem, Joe Kerwin, you would be able to tell us about this. They, they talked about, well, when do you think you can get it fixed? 15 or 20 minutes. We haven't heard anybody referring to any kind of a time frame here in the last uh, 40 minutes or so. No, we haven't. And, of course, they're looking at that software now. They, they transmitted a, a copy of all the software in that computer back to Houston. They're looking at it. They may be seeing some, uh, some little problems or... Uh, in, in inconsistencies in it. Why are there so many problems with the space shuttle? It's just too big and complicated a project to get off the ground the first time? Well, I'm remembering back to uh, the launches of both Alan Shepard and John Glenn, and it seems those were scheduled several times. I remember Wally's launch on uh, Gemini 6. Remember that, where the engines ignited and then immediately shut down and there was no liftoff? Uh, when you're working with a new machine, admittedly this one's very, very complex, uh, you have to expect this. Uh, well, our expectation is here, yeah. and we have problems this morning, and we will continue to watch those problems and hope, as you do, I'm sure, that they get solved and in time for a launch. And we'll be back after this.
Boy, I really feel good all under. Oh, here. I got my Hanes underwear on. Wash after wash, my Hanes underwear goes back to the comfortable shape it had when I took it out of the package. You should try oh. Hanes. Keep the shape to make you feel good all under. How many? Uh, two Hanes, please. Uh, uh, two tickets, please. Hanes makes you feel good all under. Now on sale. Men's and boys' all cotton underwear and boxers. For a quality-made tool that's priced for home use, get this True Temper Dirt Shovel for just $5.99 as True Value Hardware Store's Tool Value of the Month. Because it's made by True Temper, you'll be getting a strong, durable tool with a tempered steel blade that stands up to hard use, plus a long ash handle and lightweight design for good balance and leverage. Get the True Temper Shovel for just $5.99 while supplies last at True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers displaying this banner. Now, you're about to meet a 105-year-old track star who still runs the 100-yard dash. This is Candy Girl. She's 15. That's 105 to you and me. And if you really want to see her come a-running, just simply bring on the Alpo. Holy mackerel meets her natural food. An Alpo beef chunks dinner has the meat and complete nutrition dogs thrive on. Alpo's all a dog ever needs to eat. And that's a good reason for Candy Girl to run a 100-yard dash every day. Maybe Candy Girl's been around so long because Alpo's been around so long. We're back with our continuing coverage of the delayed launch of the Columbia Space Shuttle as it sits out there in the launching pad at Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center, as they continue to work on a problem with a backup computer. They are working on the problem of the software, that is the instructions of the memory, uh, not listening to the two of the other four primary computers. At least that was the early on definition that we got. It may be more than that at this point. They're working on that problem here at the Kennedy Space Center at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and of course on board as well. We haven't heard anything from them for a while. The last thing that we heard is that they were not able to give us a definite target launch time. They were working on it, and if they get the problem solved, they will then begin to get us, get us the, that. We are at T-minus 20 in holding. They had to, in effect, turn the clock back a little while ago so that they could do some realignment of onboard navigational aids as well. You know, Tom, what I find interesting about this is that we knew about the four computers and then the one computer that was added to that to be the referee in case the other computers didn't agree. And it is that referee computer, if we may call it that, that is the one that's having difficulty communicating with the other four. The basic com com computers, as far as I can tell, are in fine shape. Yeah. It